Good evening, everybody. How is everybody doing? Who? I'm talking to uh, my class. My my uh, Oswald Senior is here. He's trying to grasp the idea that I'm doing a podcast. So I'm talking to my class. Yeah. Students. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um. So tonight, uh, we are going to talk about just one sec ecosystem services and i'm sure it's a subject that you are all familiar with to some degree and if you've taken a course with me before i'm sure you heard about it before there we go can everybody see that All right, so uh, who has heard of an ecosystem service before? Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs, thumbs down. Yes, Dave has heard of an ecosystem service. Rachel has, Aaron has, I'm sure a lot of you have. So uh, some of this stuff is probably gonna be old hat to you, but some will be new and certainly kind of the contextualization of it will be probably new to you. So uh, first and foremost, um, what is it and why use this, um, this terminology? Um, now, this was highly controversial when it was first um, introduced into the mainstream. And does anybody know why it was controversial? Any ideas? monetizing nature yeah monetizing not so much monetizing because we didn't quite with monetizing it it was more yeah exactly jenny's got it it was more i mean there's been this big kind of positioning of for quite a while of the intrinsic value of nature versus utility value of nature and um humans view of it uh being kind of anthropocentric so um our perspective of nature being for our use is inherently anthropocentric whereas the critiques and they exist today less so today i mean you still get that today but it's not as as prevalent as it was before where you'd have like deep ecologists and people like this who said that you shouldn't you know you shouldn't look at nature in that way now why do you think that we kind of moved forward what are some what why do you think people are more accepting of these ideas now. Anybody have any idea? What would be a good kind of rationale why today people accept this more than the, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the key to it really is, um, you know, I think personally, um, we have kind of been pushed to the wall now with respect to the degradation of nature. And if we don't have these tools and these frameworks in order to yeah, to, to really understand what we're getting from nature and what nature needs in order to function properly, 
then we can have the debate about you know the intrinsic value versus the utility value till the cows come home but we'll be continuing to degrade it degrade it because we won't have the tools in place to enhance our ecosystem management so i think really it's kind of necessity has bred the innovative thinking i guess if you could say or the bred the necessity for for thinking of things in these terms so i can accept that you know and i you know, I've read a lot of that literature as well, the deep ecology work and Ellen Drenkson and, and um, you know, Arne Ness, people like this. And I agree with, it, but at the same time, we're in my work for sure that you're confronted with these situations where you, you that doesn't, you can't stick around debating that forever. So um, really, although this has been a concept that's been in, in discussion for a long time, like people implicitly have been talking about and thinking about ecosystem services for decades, really. Uh, it wasn't really until the early 2000s that the idea um, crystallized to the point at which it become, has become or started to become at that point and now has become part of the kind of common vernacular of decision making when it comes to natural resources, like whether it's like economic policy or even in research actually. Um, and the reason for that was, I think, I would attribute the uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, as kind of the main, one of the main things that really pushed this agenda forward. Are you all familiar with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment? Yes, I would think that you, most of you are know about it, if not have kind of experienced it. So it was in the early 2000s and 2005 is when it actually was published. And there's a lot of um, different scientists who work and social scientists who had worked on this. I'm going to push a link through. And what was cool about this, among other things, it was one of the first global assessments that was able to really synthesize this much information to give us a good snapshot of what the status of nature was. And, um, uh, and for that reason, it was uh, very useful and a good a, a pretty massive step actually to be honest with you whether or not you know you were able to dig into the fine details of everything even just looking at the overall snapshot which if you haven't read it i would take a look at and the, the key thing you don't have to go and read the whole ma it's actually the pretty lengthy um the whole assessment whereas if you look at just these synthesis reports that in itself will give you a kind of a good idea of what the what the overall status is Okay, so, but the great thing about the Millennium Assessment, though, was that it framed everything properly. Like, it was able to show people what these different ecosystem services were, were and it forced scientists and policymakers to bring their thinking into that framework. So it's, it is a very utilitarian or use applicable framework, but when you bring the science to it, uh, it, uh, it, it, it really kind of, um, it becomes very useful and in fact it can be a, it is a great tool to bring together different groups um, to make decisions about complex systems and and natural resources um, and that's one of the, the most fantastic things about it uh, is that it can really get multiple stakeholders together and allow them to speak the same language although their perspectives might be a lot different okay and it's, that's really comes through in the millennium assessment report in the sense, like, because they consulted with a variety of different stakeholders in the sub, uh, sub regional assessments where they looked at, um, sat down with different villages and groups and people within communities to get their input on, you know, what their perception of different ecosystem services. So imagine if you were sitting down with, say, you know, a group that was not very exposed to Western science uh, and uh, had foreigners coming in trying to kind of do an assessment, you, you would want some sort of framework that they could understand and say, oh, okay, well, I mean, how does this relate to our cosmology? And the MA, or the Ecosystem Service Framework, did a pretty good job at that, because you know, it allows people to think of nature in a term that relates to their existence, okay? So there's four major categories of ecosystem services, and the first one is called provisioning services, okay? So what would be an example of a provisioning service? Anybody? Something, food, right. 
fresh water. So provisioning services are literally uh, things that are the 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 processes that um, well not the processes they are the things the goods and services that nature provides us and that we use uh, for our day-to-day -day existence. So I'm going to push through some links here that I think will be um, useful just to see how it's actually used. So so this link here uh, is from the FAO. So if you look at that link, you can see that they talk about ecosystem services and biodiversity, ESB, provisioning services. So water, food, wood, and other goods are some of the material benefits people obtain from ecosystems called provisioning services. So they cite here many provisioning services are traded on markets, but in, in a lot of different regions, um, you know, they're not, like in especially in small communities where they have a direct pull on nature in order to sustain, sustain themselves. So the, the market-based ecosystem, provisioning ecosystem services are, you know, like say for instance, if you're in a farming community where you have large scale farming, and then you have kind of these commodities being produced, timber as well as an example, then you get kind of market mechanisms happening. But often in a lot of the cases, it's smallholder, small households that are reliant directly on these provisioning ecosystem services for their direct survival. There's no kind of monetary exchange between the provided ecosystem services and the household. Okay, so that's provisioning ecosystem service. And they're probably one of the most obvious ones, the obvious example. And I like to think of this stuff not like talking amongst each other, uh, students and professionals working in this field, but do these ideas make sense to non-professionals or non-people that aren't studying in this field? That's what I always need to ask myself that question. Um, and if those uh, concepts are clear enough, um, because often you're going to have to convince people of this. So there's another link here I'm going to push through. Here is is this one here. Teeb. Has anybody heard of Teeb before? Yes. Well, obviously, <laughs> obviously the people in 415 have heard of Teeb. So TEEB is a really neat example of how, um, okay, good. So you definitely want to check this out. We'll, we'll look at this more closely in, um, in, in subsequent, in 586 as we go forward. TEEB is a framework that was created for attaching economic value to ecosystems and biodiversity. It's called the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. And the idea there was initially to Put a price on nature, uh, to put a price on things that were not currently priced. So um, these are things like, um, like how do you put a price on water? How do you put a price on carbon? So what is the what are the tools that we need in order to do that? So TEEP, and it's it's been a big problem for quite some time, until of course uh, some economists and bankers came along, Pavan Sukhdev being one, and said, look, we really need to come together. Um, so we're still lost. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things with TEEB is it's defendable. Like TEEB was, uh, was created by a bunch of economists and bankers and their, their figures are pretty good. So basically what that does and helps to do is take provisioning services and non-provisioning other ones as well. But I'd like to look at provisioning services as the key one because people get it. So we can say, well, nature provides us, um, fresh water right and in some cases there's not a market value for that in a lot of cases actually for fresh water whereas cotton is an easier one because in you know have regional prices for things like staples like cotton and grain and so forth um, but TEEB gives you a framework for kind of just you know, like a, a basis for putting economic value in these ecosystem services now we'll get to why that's important as I a bit later okay so these are these provisioning services are very very useful. This idea of provisioning services is very useful from a policy standpoint, because it's very easy and clear <clears throat> to sell this idea. So when I say sell, I mean present it to someone who's a non-environmental scientist or a non-environmental professional, and they can understand it, right? Typically decision makers, either policy, legal, or economic. So. That's why provisioning services, I think, 
are, are typically the ones that are have had the most work done on them from an economic standpoint. Okay. The next set, there's four sets of ecosystem classes, I guess, if you will, of ecosystem services are regulating services. Okay. So here's a link here. So this is from Finland, actually. Uh, blah, 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 Erica, RRU environmental accounting and reporting course is all about this concept. Highly recommend. Good. Um, yes, you will be in fact teaching that, I think. Yes, I am teaching 560. That's 560, correct? Um, uh, the next set is regulating services. So what's a regulating service? What's an example of a regulating service? Predator prey cycles? Yeah, could be. That's an interesting one. Uh, forest, sure. Um, photosynthesis, I think photosynthesis is classified as one. Um, what's, what's a big one? There we go, that's the one I was looking for. <clears throat> that's the one that gets the most attention right now, carbon cycle particularly atmosphere biosphere exchange of carbon. Why does that get the most attention right now? Why is a climate, a climate, exact climate action. So the idea there is to have, uh, to look at the process of climate regulation as something that has value. Now, what's interesting about that is that there is actually quite, there has been a lot of work done on climate regulation as an ecosystem service and putting market values to that, right? So one example of that is um, forests and deforestation and their role in climate regulation. Has anybody familiar with uh, forest carbon and so forth? Forest carbon and avoided deforestation, RED, R-E-D-D. -D. Has anybody heard of R-E-D-D -D before? A little bit. I would think that this is something you need to look at. I, I would say I would almost insist on it. So let me just pull up a good link for you on this. And I'm going to make a Word document with all of these and post it with it so you have this um, just to get. So red plus, actually technically red plus. So um, here, I'll do you in red. So red is a initially a program from the United Nations um, here, UN Red, uh, which is basically about attempting to find ways of limiting and saving, limiting deforestation, particularly in tropical environments, um, such that the carbon that is stored in those rainforests stays in the, car in the, in the ecosphere, the biosphere. So basically when you cut down forests, you are uh, emitting carbon into the atmosphere, right? Um, you're reducing the amount of sequestration that occurs, and you're also combusting carbon often when you cut down the trees and then you burn off land. Um, so you're creating a carbon source. So by keeping rainforest standing, you're creating a sink of carbon. You're avoiding the emission of carbon that typically is associated with deforestation. Now, so this is initially um, was a big win, or at least was a big win, because you could promote conservation at the same time as reducing the impact on greenhouse gas emissions. But you're also, the idea with it is, is people get paid. So on the ground, either landowners or stakeholder ground, get the carbon value of the carbon, market value of the carbon, in the rainforest. So they can, rather than cut down rainforest and grow cattle, they keep the rainforest standing, and they get then remunerated in the money equivalent of carbon credits that are not emitted in the atmosphere. And that's the mechanism for Red Plus that was initially uh, the idea. Now, there's a lot of issues with it. There was land tenure issues. There's leakage issues, uh, additionality, how you have to prove that this was, was going to happen, right? This is going to get deforested. Uh, the leakage issue is, a, is an issue of what conserve one rainforest here, and then that pushes deforestation to another area. Your net gain is not as much as it would be otherwise. So there's, those are all issues that, as you look at this UN RED site, you'll see the issues that pop up with RED. But at the end of the day, what it's doing is it's addressing climate regulation 
through rainforests as a means of securing carbon in the atmosphere and regulating climate change and putting policies in place to help support that, okay? Um, big issues with that, though, with land tenure and so forth, and links, there's some cases where they don't have land tenure regimes, so the question there is who gets the cash for the rainforest, okay? So those are regulating services, and there's a variety of them. If you look at that, uh, you know, that website, uh, here, you, they talk a lot about water resources as well. So water uh, filtration and so forth as a, as a regulating service. Right, so uh, they say here, regulating so consists of ecosystem pro processes that maintain environmental conditions favorable to life, um, ensuring the reproduction of organisms. Um, so they're often silent and invisible. That's another interesting thing about these. Provisioning services is straightforward. We know we get carbon, we know we get water, whereas regulating services are a little more difficult to communicate. Even red can be tricky to communicate to people. You have to use diagrams, that's what I recommend. Okay, so those are regulating services. Another one that I'm working with right now is coastal protection, right? Like with mangroves, how they provide protection to coastal communities from inundation and so forth, from tsunamis even. Okay, so that's, we've got provisioning, we've got regulating, and the next category I have here is supporting services. Okay, so what are supporting services, ecosystem services? What do they support? There's a link. Yeah, nutrients is one. Biodiversity is another one, yep. So what's the essence of each one of those though? Yes, um, not just provisioning, they're also supporting the other ecosystem services, cultural and otherwise. So they're basically like, uh, like in a human body, they would be considered the uh, circulatory system, your homeostatic system. These are the things that support the ecosystems as a whole to allow them to provide these other services to us, which we tend to benefit from more directly. So the tricky thing about supporting ecosystem services is they're not direct. We don't see a direct kind of impact from them. So they're a little trickier to kind of communicate the importance of, right? um to decision makers whereas it's a lot easier to sell people and say look i mean we need to deal with this because you know we're getting grain from these crops or timber from this forest and this supports our industry whereas supporting are the processes that that are like the bedrock to that other uh those other kind of functions okay but equally important really when you think about it okay so if you look at that link, you'll get uh, some good examples of supporting ecosystem services. Um, the last category, what is the last category? Anybody know what the last category of ecosystem service, the fourth is? Yes. Cultural and they also put uh, a spiritual um, they kind of lump those things together. Cult it tends to be cultural, recreational, aesthetic, spiritual. Some people call them in different ways, but usually cultural slash aesthetic. Okay. Here's a link to uh, that one. Is I don't know if that's cultural or not. Yes, that is cultural. So what's an example of, of this? Anybody from British Columbia? people what what gives us recreational opportunities skiing exactly there's a great one steep slopes nice snow big powder the ocean stand up paddling wonderful sailing surfing exactly right all of those uh, are the jumbo ski <laughs> yeah exactly jumbo ski resort that's a biggie, Jumbo Ski Resort. I'm from Nelson originally, so don't get me going on that one. Forest bathing. Um, okay, I don't know that one. Is that like basking in the beautiful of forest, beauty, pre beautiful presence of forest? 
Okay. Forest bathing. I, okay, wasn't aware of that one. That's new. Japanese. Forest bathing in Japanese. Okay. Good for the health. I'm sure. Yeah. So, I mean, forest bathing is Japanese. I see. Okay. So, I mean, basically, these are things that we experience as kind of aesthetic, cultural, recreational, or even spiritual experiences that we derive from nature, right? And they can be less economic than, than, than more, and they can also be less, less direct. Like another good example is ecotourism, right? Whale watching. You can't go watching whales without, you can't go whale watching without there being whales, correct? Right. But this one is a great one. Like I like this ecosystem service because you can, you know, you can sit down with decision makers and say, look, I mean, you know, your industry is changing. Uh, skiing, good example, as a result of kind of the impacts on the global biosphere and the global climate. So this ecosystem service, which a lot of industries are heavily dependent on, need help or they need to kind of pay attention to these other things that are negatively impacting them. Okay. And again, there's ways of looking at the economics behind them as well, like what, how much revenue is derived and so forth and so on. And we're not going to get into that too much in this course or in this discussion, but that's a whole area into itself. But, you know, we all appreciate nature and a good sunset. That's a, it's a cultural ecosystem service. So what are the policy implications? Um, Whale tourism can impact whales. Yes. Okay. I'm going to get to that. Right. That's that's an area that I want to talk about next. So, what are the policy implications? Well, what do you think the policy implications are for this kind of framework for ecosystem services as a whole? Are they significant? Or are they not? Do you think this is important for policy, or do you think it's unimportant for policy? And policy sets out the rules by which we govern ourselves as societies. Dave, sure. Very important. Should be significant. Important. So it is, you know, and it's becoming more important now because the kind of the, the modern vernacular, which we can attribute the progress on that from the Millennium Assessment, has really brought this to the forefront. So there's actually some massive policy implications for adopting an ecosystem service lens. And that's what it is, it's a lens, it's a way of looking at things. So one, uh, it forces decision makers to look at natural resources slightly differently, right? Because typically in say at, at uh, you know, Ministry of uh, Forestry or, or NRCAN or, or the equivalent in the United States, I mean, you'd have, you know, you'd have to have policymakers looking at the output, the annual allowable cut for forests, uh, uh, potential mineral reserves, and, and these kind of natural resources that we pull as kind of the main unit of analysis. Whereas now, if you're looking at forestry policy, you definitely have to look at these other ecosystem services and ensure that they are not being disrupted in any fundamental way. So what would be a good example of uh, a time in which we didn't pay attention to that, or at least significant changes to um, to, to um, the kind of the overall environment impacted um, provisioning services. I'm talking forestry. Think invasive, well not invasive species, think of specific species. There we go, got it. Mountain pine beetle, spruce budworms, another one. Um, there's ones in, oh God, African snails, ash beetle, African snails in Antigua. I was just there two, three weeks ago, and gosh, they're it's crazy. And they've got like this massive. They're invasive, but I don't think pine beetles aren't in, technically an invasive species. They've just their poly, their populations have been impacted because of changes in, in climate. It seems. So I mean, when you look at it from this standpoint, by taking an ecosystem service lens or approach to this issue, you can start to look at okay, well, with changes in certain regulating services you can provisioning services can be profoundly impacted and if provisioning services are impacted believe me it becomes an important policy issue for decision makers like if a whole industry just doesn't exist anymore for small towns in british columbia okay so it has a very big implications for policy 
Um, in addition, though, the other important aspect, I think, for policy that the ecosystem service framework brings is the fact that um, there, uh, if we take this lens, we can start to see that there are um, externalities or invisible contributions that ecosystem services make that have a very material impact on society, right? So in looking at this, we, um, we are forced in decision making to see that these items or these issues and, and ecosystem issues that we previously took for granted or just said, well, that's just happening. If there's fundamental changes to them, there can be some very big kind of uh, overall impacts. So this forces us to look at then a much broader take on, on policy. Okay. So um, now what are some of the economic implications of all of this? What do you think the economic implications are for this kind of framework? Are there economic issues, considerations? Um, yes, depends on your industry, but yes, for sure. Well, for one, I guess, uh, redirecting of priorities, yes. I can speak from the business standpoint in the sense that um, by taking a look uh, such as this perspective on things, uh, we can go about um, framing our analysis in quite a bit of a different way. So uh, from a business standpoint, by taking a broader view and looking at ecosystem services as a whole, I'll give you the example of Puma, the company Puma, what they are able to do by taking that approach and looking at the economic values of ecosystem services they rely on is to to better understand risk, okay? So how do you think that, how, how do you think that is? Like why, how can they better understand risk by looking at ecosystem services for a company like Puma? What would be important for them? Costs, yep. What else? Consumer attitudes, that's part of it. Ah, there we go. Yes, that's the one I was looking for. Where? That's another one. These two last, Jenny and JP, those are important issues because I'll put them together. By looking at an ecosystem service framework for a business, you could do the same thing. I'm just talking about business. Government can too. It forces you to look at where your products are coming from, like in case of Puma, they're manufacturing clothing products and they're made in different countries. It forces you to look at what's required, where you're making them, what's manufactured, like how is your product produced, okay? And by doing that, you also have to look at how reliant are you on different aspects of the ecosystem services, different types of ecosystem services, say provisioning, right? If you're using cotton or uh, whatever, um, if you're looking at, for aggregate, for cement, but in the case of Puma, you're looking at a lot of physical materials. You have to look at the sources and where they're coming from and the, and the stability of the supply, right? So if you're in a place where you're using a lot of cotton, you know the rate of use of cotton for your production. Um, you also, if you're smart, you start to look at, well, how stable is that supply? What are some things, like JP was saying, if the resources that require disappear, they can't function. So what would be some things that might influence that? If you're looking at, say, cotton use or any kind of other kind of, you know, staple biological product. <clears throat> What might impact that sourcing? Yes, 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 yes. So guess what? We've just stumbled onto one of the most important risk analysis that we need to do right now, which is better understand what the current risk is, what the future risk is, uh, and how exposed businesses are, organizations are <clears throat> to these factors. And ecosystem services provides this kind of analytical base 
for you to do that kind of a work, right? You need to know what these things are, where are they coming from, how much you're using, and then what are the conditions that sustain them, <clears throat> right? So how do you then measure that? So the biophysical, there's two components to this then. There's the biophysical component, right? So how would you measure, say, uh, um, provisioning of, of water at a, a plant in Morocco? What would you, what would you use to measure that? Say if you're using water or, or cotton, two of those. You'd have to look at some sort of biophysical monitoring system, right? So a good example is Vol uh, Volkswagen's work in Puebla, Mexico, where they use a tremendous, uh, quite a bit of uh, water they're using for their production facility. And they had to, uh, they were running low on water at one point in the community. And that then forced Volvo or Volkswagen to start to implement water efficiency, gray water programs and so forth in order to have a more optimal use of that. And then they actually implemented a watershed conservation program and reforestation program such that they could um, have the ecosystems um, stabilize the water supply there. It's very dry in Puebla, right? So you have to measure these things from a biophysical standpoint, but then you have to look at the economics of it <clears throat> in order to really get at this kind of risk analysis. And so what would you use for the economic part of this then? What would be one of tool? Cost benefit, yes, but how do you get costs? Yep, supply chain analysis, but how do you get the costs? <clears throat> how do you get the figures? Numbers. We've already gone through it tonight. It's a trick question. You say it immediately. Triple bottom line, yeah, you can produce those. Those are all tools. Supply chain, yes. Cost benefit, yes. Triple bottom line balance sheets, yes. But how do you get that number? How do you get the number? Yes. That is one way of getting at it. This is why it was so beneficial to have Teeb come along because it actually gave people a pretty legitimate framework to put numbers to these things. Okay? So you can take those figures and they have Teeb for agriculture, Teeb for industries. And, and have regional kind of um, parameters that do it for regions. And you can then do cost benefit, right? You can do these to look at the supply chain. You can the triple bottom line, but you're looking more at the environmental cost of things. So you need that. You need to measure things, but then you need to cost things as well. And the ecosystem service kind of model gives you the framework to put stuff together in. That's what the beauty of it is, okay? <clears throat> I can put through some examples too. All right. So lastly then, so now that we have this, what are some pressing issues and solutions that we need to look at then? What are some pressing issues? Now I'm going to give you the example of the stuff I work on right now, which is in Caribbean and small island developing states. Okay. So what do you think in these regions like St. Lucia, Antigua, Barbados, Guyana, uh, Belize, um, what do you think, why, how would this kind of model be useful? What would be the most, one of the most useful means of applying this model, the most relevant ways where you'd want to apply this in these countries, in this region? Where do you think? For what purpose? Bingo, bingo, bingo. Sarah, Erica, Shannon, good job. Why? Jobs, money, yes. Yes, for economic development. The economies of these regions are fundamentally development, uh, is fundamentally dependent on tourism. It is everything to them. In fact, the, the I was in Antigua, like I said, a few weeks ago, and the decision to, to stop flights going into Antigua was a massive decision. It took a long time to get to that decision to say, look, we got to do this. Because that kind of flow of revenue from those people is so important to everybody, cab drivers, the government for tax revenue, hotel operators, restaurants, everything, right? 
that stops, you know, things will get impacted. But what is it dependent on? Like, why is that? Why does it occur? Decrease in cruise with extreme? Yes, Sarah. The reason why they people go there is because it's beautiful. Resources, natural resources, in order to protect the colonies, this is just kind of has to be developed. Yes, it does. So we need to apply these frameworks in this place, sense of place, you're drawing from the literature, very good, uh, to create the rationale, the logical rationale, not only this idealist and vision of how we need to live in harmony with nature, I mean, which is great, and, you know, I've been like immersed in that literature for a long time, but at a very practical level, in some regions, this makes so much sense that it's a necessity. It's not like a frill because with uh, coral reefs, and I went snorkeling actually when I was in Antigua, I hadn't been before, and it was, I was shocked. It was quite, not good. Like it was quite terrible actually, to be honest. And I thought to myself, I talked to my, the, the group we're working with and the government said, what's, what's going on? Like, is this, and apparently, what had happened, there's a big storm there two, two years ago, went through it, really knocked out Bar, uh, Barbuda, which is just the, you know, the small island off of Antigua. And uh, that storm really mixed up the dirt or the, the sediment in, um, in, the, uh, in the ocean. And it, uh, it really impacted the coral. So ever since that storm, the coral has been uh, not as vibrant and uh, not destroyed completely, but not, doesn't pop. Like it's not like other places I've been before. But really, you can look at that and you can say, well, look, the ecosystem service here was degraded and then put a value on, well, what's the impact of that? Well, why, who's going to go snorkel there when they go to, I don't know, someplace else like Utila or Rotan or, or a place like this in Honduras or, or Belize? So this is where it becomes a real pressing issue. And so then we start to link the greater issues of, say, climate change and climatic variability, and that then has large implications for other sectors, uh, not just tourism, but agriculture and so forth. So just to cycle back then to the macro view, um, this is where we see the real practical utility of the ecosystem service framework in informing policy to craft, um, craft plans and strategies to really enact sustainable development, but like put some economics to it. Because as soon as you put economics to this, you can get the, the heads of state, um, which by the way, are fully on board with all of these ideas, Heads of state in Caribbean, in the Caribbean, they are like, because they, it's so obvious the connection between the economic development and their vulnerability. And yes, you create the business case for that. And I don't want to like put everything back to business, but it really like it, 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 it's, it's an effective way of mobilizing this opportunity impact and also risk. As it is 1.4 billion trials and is the third largest in the world. And okay, good reference there, Hunter 2002. Okay, so now putting this all together, I mean, this um, back at 2005, we uh, when we were we were just getting going with the uh, the ecosystem service framework, I don't think we really realized the power of it at that time. It was a nice to do. It allows to see the relationship and how things work. It really was a good diagnostic tool, so you could see what's what is the condition? Is it degrading? Is it improving? Is it going down? Is it stabilizing of different ecosystem services? So really good for diagnosing what's going on. But now, fast forward 15 years, it's there's good science behind all this stuff to measure things. There's better economics. It's not ideal, but it's a lot better than it was before. And we're now in the range of the world of like putting this stuff together with technology tools to really kind of create that business case and create the the tools and and the faculties for making better decisions. Um, so I'm optimistic about this. And in fact, I was I'm far more into ecosystem services now as an idea than I was in 2005, six, and seven when I first got exposed to it at McGill because you know I see the utility of it now and it's no longer just this kind of an advocacy tool which it kind of was at that point, but it, now it's a it's an operational decision making tool. Okay. Boom. So that's kind of the, the overall idea of it. Now I've skimmed over a lot of things um, and I will share a document with these links and so forth and some additional literature and references for you to take a look at. But I think what this does give you is give you what is the framework, what are the components of it, how is it useful, and then 
where might this be applied today? And that's kind of what I wanted to set out with tonight, especially for those who'd never heard of it before. Okay, does he have any questions? Anybody have any questions? None here. Steve speechless. I didn't think it was possible. No questions. Are there any other easy to digest examples of application of ecosystem services? Uh, yes, there are. Um, in what area? Like one of the best ways, I like the, the best examples that I have seen, I like to use a lot are, and I'll get it for you here. This is, I, I like these ones personally, because you, know, you can look at the academic literature, the research literature, <clears throat> uh, but it can get really, I don't know, heavy and stuff. These are good. These are some to the T case studies. If you go there, you'll see on that website, if you go that, you can look at their region. So global, you can look at Africa. They got a ton of them, 17 different case studies from Africa. Asia, there's, uh, oh my gosh, 45 in Asia, Central America, seven, Europe, there's uh, 16, North America, 14, Oceania, five, and South America, there's 16. And these show you, I mean, these are TEAB analysis, but in most TEAB analysis case studies, you can see they break it down into ecosystem services, and it's quite clear, right? Okay, Eric has flood protection in Miami. He took this course from Robbie. He mentioned that Miami spends millions a year flood for the coast. Yeah, I don't know if you would have conserved the estuaries before reduced. So that's a good example of, uh, you could see the same thing for tsunami protection. New Orleans is a great example. New Orleans, um, there's a lot of those coastal zones where they spend a lot of money on infrastructure, whereas if they would spend that on natural infrastructure, they could have had better results. Do you have any thoughts, examples on how circular economy um, would complement practice in ecosystem. Yes, I'm working on a project, not in tourism, but I'm working on a circular economy project using ecosystem services in actually in fashion, would you believe? Um, and we're looking at kind of creating a model uh, where, you know, f designers and clothing producers and stores as well uh, can have a framework for traceability of what goes into different products uh, and then using blockchain technology to have that store um, communicate to the consumers exactly where these products come from. Traceable, ice, same idea. Patagonia is a good example. We're actually like trying to take that to a new level where you can go and take a QR code, bang, and it's going to trace back what went into making that product, that T-shirt, amount of water, amount of cotton, amount of dye, and so forth and so on. You then trace that to the actual ecosystem services. And we're talking to a major clothing company in Canada uh, to pilot it. I don't want to say anything right now, but it's uh, a major, not clothing company, but a clothing store, like a store that sells it. No, it's not MEC. Better than MEC. MEC, that's, that's the converted. This is the non-converted. This is mainstream. Um, yeah, I mean, it's we're trying to just make it like kind of normal, right? As opposed to like, Patagonia is great, don't get me wrong, MEC is great, Arcteryx is great, <clears throat> but everybody's bought into that. Like most people go to MEC, get it anyway. Whereas when you go to this store, I mean, those people go there because they get their stuff there. And the fact that they would see what, how much water goes into it would be like a revolution, a revelation for them. Not that they'd make anything different. I don't know if they'd make a different decision. The, the research doesn't necessarily support that that people make better ecological decisions if they know what goes into it. But, I mean, it, it's transforming the paradigm in a way, if we can pull that off. So, um, back to the circular economy, yes. And the idea is to, like, get people thinking in those terms and representing it, like seeing where things come from. 
Um, and then that can lead to a bunch of different things. So yeah, I'd say there's there's some action there, circular economy, and I think it's a perfect fit. My big thing right now is using this kind of framework for risk analysis, right? So when you're looking at infrastructure projects on the coastal zone of E or elsewhere, where you can look at, okay, well, here's the upside of the project. We get jobs, we get this much oil being shipped or whatever, or whatever it is, you know, whatever the direct benefit you get from those provisioning services which are going to market. However, there's also a downside to those projects. Like what if there's a problem? What are the impacts of that? That's what into using it for cost benefit analysis. What are the potential costs? There's a risk of a spill. What what costs might that have? In some cases, the cost could be astronomical, <clears throat> like the impact of an oil spill on, on ecotourism in the coastal zone of BC it could be rather substantial. And we don't really have the figures to support that yet in our analysis, and we should have that, right? So that's stuff I'm working on. And then also using different ways of knowing. That's the other thing we didn't talk about here was we've assumed that we just use kind of Western science to assess what all these ecosystem services are, which is not completely accurate. You know, we need to look at different knowledge bases and give us, say, indigenous traditional ecological knowledge from an indigenous perspective. Uh, local knowledge, some people that have been living in this region for a long time, so this goes back to Tomasha's sense of place, um, whereas that knowledge is, is kind of, you know, in some cases more valuable and accurate than model output or whatever it is, or whatever kind of measurement in Western science we're using. So ways of knowing of certain things is an important consideration as well in this whole kind of problematic, which really needs a lot of work too. So to conclude, there's one thing that we didn't talk about, which was <clears throat> we've just assumed there's a one-way flow. We're doing stuff, we benefit from it. We use kind of provisioning services and impact regulating services. However, there's this dynamic that is occurring and in the research there's some neat stuff being done by folks at UBC actually on how do we model then how when we are kind of extracting or conducting ourselves, we are then altering the ecosystem services by the amount of which, amount which we're extracting. So there's there is this kind of systematic inter, interplay, which for those in eco, e, ECO 586, this whole idea of using social and ecological coupling um, to look at that, that you need to then look at that component. So it's not just extraction, there's also that impact that we're causing on the ecosystem services. So there's a dynamic there, this kind of social and ecological systems that are coupled. So we need to look at that uh, from, from, uh, from an analytical standpoint as well. And so if you look at those readings, like the adaptive cycle and so forth and Carl Foke's work, you'll see that there are ways we can kind of map that out and conceptualize that. All right? So that's an area that, that some neat, there's some neat things happening. But you know, at the same time, like I don't like to overcomplicate things because frankly, when you're sitting down with bankers or, or heads of state in the Caribbean or wherever, I mean, they really kind of, we can talk about resilience all day and they'll give you like a two minutes. And if you don't get the point across really quickly, then, you know, you're out the door. So you got to be focused on sometimes. And that's where you have to be on message. Good. All right. So we're at uh, an hour now uh, on decoupling. The circular model goes beyond the linear model. Come to decoupling. Yeah. Now, this decoupling idea, I, in principle, agree with it. You know, decoupling economic activity from environmental degradation. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of work to be done there, though. So we need to work on that quite a bit. We need to have the data first um, to really kind of demonstrate that we're decoupling. Uh, ideally, yes, if we could have economic activity that had you know, net positive impact, fantastic net positive impact on ecosystem services. We're re regenerating nature through economic activity. I love it. I want to see it happen. But we need the data. We need to measure stuff. Right? All right, folks. Thank you very much for coming out. I've got Oswald Sr. here. He needs dinner. So that is what I shall do.
I'm going to sit down and prepare dinner for him and explain to him that it's ecosystem services that are providing us the dinner. All right? I'm going to live my learning. Thank you for coming out. He's out of there. Yeah. He's safe. Oswald Sr. is safe. And symptom-free. <laughs>